Now, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq have been pretty great for the stock market, but we've seen the Dow take some advantage off that over the past week or so. But let's get into Fed. You see, Fed Powell spoke this previous week, and it kind of was all good, dandy. Uh, apparently, PPI, CPI didn't matter, and things went as planned. But that might not be everything that we have to be paying attention to, because we need to be looking at what's happening with the underlying mortgage rates, rents, what's happening in credit card delinquencies, and the overall strength of the market. Because based on this week of loan, you're going to have quite a bit that's happening on our schedule that we have to attack so let's get to it just this week alone we have quite a bit on the calendar it's not going to be cpi or ppi but you're going to get a little bit of information so we've had a little bit of a blackout period over the past week so starting off strong on monday and just to let you know it's a four-day week you have fed member bostic speaking and then you have your new home sales data i do think home sales will be dropping on the decline and it'll kind of start surging into summer that's my overall opinion there so going into then tuesday you kind of have a little bit of stuff going on here nothing too crazy consumer confidence don't don't care too much about that Atlanta Fed GDP DDP will be interesting but then again on you know going into Thursday you have your GDP on that day as well Wednesday not too much happening mortgage rates come out there and then as well as GDP coming in on Thursday and then PC as well coming in I believe on Friday it is yeah Friday coming in uh, with the PCE data so pretty interesting to be seeing what's happening there remember this week is good Friday so again should be a slower week it is a holiday as you can see there but PC that will not stop us that will affect us going into next week just to let you know but again the biggest thing happening Happening here in my opinion you're gonna have gdp coming in on wednesday and then as well as you have some fed members speaking throughout the week because it was a previous blackout period something was kind of up this entire week we saw overall volume on the s p down it was pretty brutal as we look at volume on this week you can definitely see there wasn't much happening now monday actually was your highest volume which traditionally never happens and we'll go into that here in a second but 88 mil 60 on tuesday 69 wednesday 60 79 pretty low volume overall if we go over to edgeful the link is down below if you want to check them out for their data analytics you can see traditionally over the past 52 weeks so we've been trending on the uptrend on volume monday tuesday wednesday thursday friday friday usually being our peak and then if we also look at what's happening with price action here you can also see going into here with green and red days by weekday you know the end of the week tends to be our best and kind of this week it was like all over the place all inverted so those are really important things to take into account we go look at spy and as you look at this past week you know we didn't get that great you know red day on monday green on monday on uh, tuesday and wednesday thursday and friday ended up being red so again not the greatest days all things considered totally inverted from what was the quote-unquote norm but is that kind of leading into what's happening and with these holidays coming up that's the major question and i think it's arguable based on this volume that's coming out something that we saw around the beginning of the year as well remember when we said january 8th when we expected the market to pick up and it kind of did now we also were going through a blackout period where no fed members speak except pal and that's going to be coming to an end obviously tomorrow so when we look at what's happening there as well I have to think maybe the market was cooling off and there's a big theory going on right now that basically the head fed and then what's happening in with boj they just started raising rates for the first time in like 20 years those guys are coming out pretty dovish pretty strong on the market right dovish dovish whatever you want to say right they're coming out stronger on the market and then the people under them come out a little bit more hawkish or expecting more downside more realistic viewpoints and it's an interesting tactic because so far for the fed it's worked for the past year year and a half Powell comes out, says, everything's great. Inflation's handled. We're going on the right path, even though sometimes things don't look that great. And then the other Fed members come out, give a kind of realistic viewpoint, some concerns, and then they can say that they covered both sides of it and they cover their ground. Now, Powell has said, based on some of the upcoming data we're going to cover in a second, that they need to start rate cutting rates for the safety of banks and the housing market overall, that they're going to have to start doing that most likely in summer, which are still pricing in those three rate cuts, which is why the market's still so in love with everything tech. So what we're going to do first is go over that mortgage data specifically. And when we look at that mortgage data, kind of interesting. Okay, so if we go back to 2008, everyone's like, oh, well, look, Tyler, you know, 2008, this is the greatest representation of what's happening right now. The housing market's in a crash. Well, in 2008, um, just to let you know, uh, the, the mortgage rates dropped dramatically. And I want to let you know if the mortgage rates dropped dramatically like this to 2%, which we're higher right now in mortgage rates than we were back then, um, but it's a totally different circumstance. Um, if that happened, the housing market right now would actually explode because the rental market would get hit so hard. It would be actually the greatest case scenario for our economy for rates to drop like this, like they did back in 08 through 09, 11, just to give you a viewpoint, which I don't think is going to happen. I think at the most, these things can come down to is like 5%. 
maybe four and a half percent with rate cuts on the 30 year mortgages. That's my current opinion. Then you go look at credit card delinquencies. And I, before we go to that, I do want to cover this right here as well is credit card and auto loan delinquencies continue to rise. And this was from February this past year among younger borrowers. And I want to highlight this is that first of all, these younger borrowers are the people that we should be concerned about, right? People actually around my age, I'm not being irresponsible. Just trust me, bro. Uh, but these are the people that are taking loans at very high rates, right? These people don't have houses. If you go look at what's happening with the younger borrowers as well, they're still living with parents they're still roommates, things along those lines. And so those aren't the people and they're not buying at these. They're just not. Okay. It's just like the reality of the situation. But when you go to credit card delinquencies, those are the people that are getting hit. But if we also look at these delinquencies, we're nowhere like we were back in 08, which also was kind of twofold. You have credit cards delinquencies, you know, at highs and near six, seven, you know, 5%, give or take. And you also had mortgage rates, you know, at local highs as well. We're getting one without the other in this case right now. So again, this has me on the thesis that Powell has to cut, like he, he just has to, or we're going to have big problems down the line. And, and that's what you don't want to happen overall, right? You don't want to have that overall. And I think Powell knows this and that's why he's been subtly mentioning this over and over and over again. When we look at the market, it's important that we view it from both sides, not just where I can be right, but also where I can be wrong. Now, hypothetically, if the market starts going through absolute nonsense and we just continue ripping like beyond all means and the housing market stabilizes and rents get better and they start going down in price, which I don't see how all that could happen. But if that does happen, in theory, Powell would not cut rates. He wouldn't. If the market didn't show signs of weakness on the delinquencies and on the home, home equities part of it with mortgages, then you wouldn't have to. But those parts are still rising. And that's why when you see inflation in these numbers, you know, especially, especially rents going up, that's why you have to consider and say he has to cut because the only way that rent prices go down is if Powell does that. We've already seen unemployment rise to almost 4% and it's not hurting the rent prices. Rent prices continue to track to the upside. Again, and that's all because of what's happening specifically with the demand on houses and mortgages and people have to find somewhere to live. If you're not gonna pay for something, it's not gonna be your rent. And in half these states, you can live there rent free just squatting. So these are all things that are major, major concerns. However, the likelihood of the possibility for him not to cut, for those things to actually happen, are far less likely in my opinion, because it would take a miracle, right? For all those things good to happen on all sides of the metrics, right? So again, that's what I'm looking at specifically there. And this is totally different. And if you watch my interview that I did on the second channel, then it gives you a really good idea at the end of that video about why cutting rates would be bullish inherently for the stock market specifically. And on the long term, long run, this could cause major pain in the next year or two years for the housing market. It could because people flood back into the housing market at higher five, six percent rates. And then, you know, eventually the slowdown does hit with growth in GDP. That totally could happen. But that's a year down the line. And honestly, most of you people here don't really care about a year down the line. Y'all care about what's going to happen right now, right? And you know, how can I make money in the short term? But let's look at the charts on the S&P and Qs. Now, on Friday's video, I went over a lot of stocks and a lot of things there. So I'm not going to do too much of that today. I'm just going to give you a quick rundown of the S&P 500. Now, the SPY, as much as people want to be bearish, I mean, this is the this is literally, this is the daily chart, guys. I'm I'm not kidding you. So, um you know, I could quickly draw this out and you can see that you're in a, a direct upward channel since November 16th. Um, so everyone that's like, we need a short and we're going to crash. Best of luck. Um, there's no reason to go short in this trend, in my opinion. If we start breaking down below 508, 505, you're going to have every opportunity to go short. So there's no reason to try to catch your time to top. That's my personal opinion. Do what you want, want with that information. Okay. Do what you want with that. So I do believe you you don't have to short. You don't have to be the first one to short. Um, we look at cues and maybe a little less stability here. Arguably it's a more volatile push that you get. You can see the range is definitely broader here on cues. Um, a little bit. It's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to see because you're still so strong. Um, but you get really nice pushes, then declines and push and decline, push decline. So again, I think spy has been more stable, less downside, less volatile. Um, but cues obviously in tech are still very strong. Anytime you see like some reaction on the market saying, Oh, tech looks weak. They come out with better earnings, better revenue and better outlooks. And as long as those three things continue to happen, it's hard to be bearish on those indicators on those stocks and equities. Okay. Now, again, 
I'm all for the downside. If it happens, it happens. I'll, I'll gladly make money on the downside. But again, I'm not going to start forcing this up here at 450, 446. We start breaking below 432, 435. Then we can talk. But up until that point, I have to, you know, stay in my lane and understand how I've made money on this channel over the past three, four, five months, right? And it's been sticking with the overall trend. IWM here, right? IWM has been trading here in a channel for basically two, I mean, it's going to be going on three years, but now you're finally breaking down and trying to hold above 206, 207. In reality, this thing gets over 212, 210. I mean, small caps, which it looks like it's going to going into summer. I'm just telling you right now, you're going to see another explosion. What happened way back here when we started breaking on IWM? If you guys remember, this was the like one of the greatest markets of all time. Mid 2020 through like 20, you know, arguably 2022, but we'll just say mid 2020 through mid 2021 was incredible. Stocks went berserk. I mean, they went, you could trade anything, right? It was, I, it was literally a SPAC season, right? And it was crazy. It was cool. It was awesome, right? Right now it's AI season, but when this happens, you're going to see a lot of money flow back into the market. And again, I believe that will happen when rate cuts start to appear in the market. And those are things you have to be looking for. Now I go and I look at something like DXY and again, I, I can recognize some of the pain or some of the downside that could be established here. But again, we need to get more understanding and see more stability here and get more overall decision-making. Cause right now it seems really choppy and really back and forth. Anytime you're going through your 200 SMA every single day or every single week, that's not a good idea. You, that's not stable. The only concern here too would be the US 30 year yield. But again, I do imagine the 30 year yield will start dropping based on the projections from the Fed. And if you look at something like TLT, which has been basically tracks the 30 year yield as well, it's basically based on the 20, but still, you can still see here, in my opinion, the, the TLT, it's clearly bull flagging. It's clear as day. Now, I don't like that you're going through your 200 SMA, but this thing is clearly flagging to the upside. It's, I mean, again, and again, it lines right up with what's happening with the 30 year yield flagging to the downside. And we already know we get below 4%. We expect major buying to occur on the market dramatically. And if that happens below 4%, you have to imagine mortgage rates drop as well. And I have to say this over and over. There is a direct correlation with the strength of the market and what happens with mortgages and what happens with home sales. Um, and if you see any time over the past three, two years when home sales surge, the market does very well every single time. So again, those are things that we have to be paying attention to. I didn't want to spend too much time on this video, but I wanted to give a bit of an update on what I'm expecting over this week and what I'm watching with specific data, and especially coming from the Fed. If you have questions, comment down below. I'll see you guys either tomorrow or Tuesday. Have a good one, traders.